This video is about ventricular septal defects. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe the pathophysiology, identify the clinical presentation, and understand the management of ventricular septal defects, or VSD for short. Let's start off with a general overview of congenital heart defects, categorizing them into acyanotic versus cyanotic conditions. Acyanotic conditions have left to right shunting, causing oxygenated blood to recirculate through the lung, instead of circulating to the rest of the body. Cyanotic conditions, on the other hand, have right to left shunting. This causes deoxygenated blood in the right side of the heart to bypass the lungs and go straight back into the body without picking up oxygen. VSDs fall under the acyanotic category. They are the most common congenital heart defect. VSDs can be sporadic, part of the congenital syndrome, or a component of more complex defects, such as the tetralogy of fallow. They usually occur in the membranous portion of the septum. The direction of blood flow through the VSD depends on the differential pressures between the ventricles. It also depends on the resistance and the outflow tracks from each ventricle, especially in a case where the VSD is large enough for the pressures in the right and left ventricles to equalize. In the absence of other defects, systemic resistance is much higher than pulmonary vascular resistance. This causes the left-to-right shunt that we see in isolated VSDs. The lungs become over-circulated, which leads to the symptoms seen in VSDs as the disease progresses. During the first two weeks of life, pulmonary vascular resistance remains high. This keeps shunting from the left to a minimum, and allows patients with large VSDs to be asymptomatic. However, as pulmonary resistance decreases over the first 6 to 8 weeks of life, shunting increases and causes symptoms to develop. The presentation of a VSD is highly variable and depends on both the size of the defect and the state of pulmonary vascular resistance. Patients with small defects tend to be asymptomatic and may present later as adults. Today, VSDs are largely picked up in neonates by a murmur noted on examination. Larger defects, however, may lead to pulmonary overcirculation and eventually congestive heart failure. These patients present in early childhood with tachypnea, dyspnea, fatigue, diaphoresis during feeding, and failure to thrive. On examination, a hollow systolic murmur at the left lower sternal border is classic of VSD. Smaller VSDs are associated with a louder murmur, as compared to a larger VSD, which produces a softer murmur. Additionally, a mid-diastolic murmur may be heard at the apex, due to the increased volume of blood flowing across a now relatively small mitral valve. The increased volume of blood flow is due to the left-to-right shunting present in VSDs. As pulmonary arterial pressures begin to increase, a loud P2 and narrow splitting of S2 may be present. Bibasal crepitations in the lungs and hepatomegaly may also be observed due to fluid overcirculation. Large VSDs may lead to changes on chest X-rays and ECGs. With a large amount of shunting, ECG may reflect left atrial and ventricular enlargement and hypertrophy. If something is severe, right ventricular hypertrophy may also occur. Chest X-rays show cardiomegaly with enlargement of the pulmonary artery and increased pulmonary vascular markings. 2D echo with Doppler is diagnostic of VSD. VSD can lead to complications, primarily congestive cardiac failure. However, 
The important complication to learn at this point is the development of Eisenmenger syndrome. The increased volume of blood received by the lungs causes increased pulmonary pressure and increased pulmonary vascular resistance. Eventually, the resistance in the lung overcomes the resistance in the aorta, leading to a reversal in the direction of the shunt. Blood now flows from the right heart to the left, leading to late cyanosis. This pulmonary hypertension in the setting of a congenital heart defect is what we call Eisenmenger syndrome. Up until recently, treatment for this was limited to heart-lung transplants and palliative care. Recently, however, vasodilators approved for idiopathic pulmonary hypertension have been shown to improve symptoms in Eisenmenger syndrome. It is also recommended as part of patient management. Let us now turn to the management of VSDs. Note that most VSDs will close spontaneously. However, there are options for symptomatic treatment. The goal for this would be addressing the congestive heart failure and failure to thrive in these children. Target caloric intake should be increased to meet the children's increased metabolic demands. These children also tend to have poor intake due to tiring while feeding. Nasogastric boluses or continuous feeding may be necessary in severe cases. Diuretics can be given to address fluid overload from heart failure and ACE inhibitors can be given to decrease afterload, thereby decreasing the volume of the shunt to the right heart. The use of digoxin presumably to help with heart contractility in the setting of large defects is debatable. In patients with small shunts and normal pulmonary arterial pressures, surgery is not recommended. However, large defects can lead to changes in the pulmonary vascular system. The proper management for these patients is early surgical correction of the VSDs before too much damage, and especially Eisenmenger's syndrome, sets in. Some indications with surgery are listed here. However, how much benefit a patient will get from surgical intervention depends on the preoperative pulmonary vascular resistance. If the elevation in the pulmonary resistance has already reached moderate to severe levels, pulmonary vascular disease is likely not to change after the operation and may even continue to progress. Patients with normal or mildly elevated pulmonary vascular resistance have much better prognosis following surgery. The last component in the management of the VSDs is considering antibiotic prophylaxis against bacterial endocarditis. Antibiotic prophylaxis for dental procedures is indicated in some children with congenital heart defects, such as unrepaired cyanotic heart defects. Antibiotic prophylaxis are not indicated for VSDs, unless undergoing a dental procedure within six months of repair. So in summary, VSDs are the most common congenital heart defect. It leads to left to right shunting, causing over-circulation of the lung and elevation in pulmonary vascular resistance over time. Eisenmenger's syndrome is an important complication due to changes in pulmonary resistance that lead to the reversal of a shunt and late cyanosis. While small and asymptomatic VSDs do not require much treatment, large VSDs should undergo early surgical intervention to avoid pulmonary vascular disease. Quiz time. Question 1. A one-month-old infant presents with poor feeding, fever, and cough over the past one week and appears unwell. He was previously well, and the birth history was unremarkable. On examination, there were bilateral crepitations heard posteriorly and a loud pan-systolic murmur loudest over the lower left sternal edge. The liver was palpable 4 cm below the costal margin and he is pink on room air with an SpO2 of 95%. Vitals were heart rate of 167 per minute, respiratory rate of 58 per minute, and a blood pressure of 66 over 40. What is the most likely reason for the poor feeding? T 
The answer is A, congestive heart failure. Question 2. You are examining a well two-month-old boy. He appears to be pink, well thrived with a normal birth history and birth weight of 3 kg, and now weighs 4.2 kg. You notice a 3 out of 6 pan-systolic murmur over the lower left sternal border. S2 is normal, and he has no hepatomegaly. What is the appropriate next step in management for this patient? The answer is C, a regular review and monitoring of growth. Question 3. You are reviewing a well two-month-old boy with a known ventricular septal defect detected neonatally. He is growing and feeding well. The liver is palpable, one centimeter below the right costal margin, and is soft. Heart sounds S1 and S2 are well heard, and there is a loud pan-systolic murmur heard best over the lower left sternal edge. He is acyanotic on room air. What is the best management plan with regards to the ventricular septal defect? The answer is B. Reassure the parent and review again at the next visit.